Now that we understand a little bit about how our minds work and the mental tendencies we employ on a daily basis, let's try to apply that to a fire scenario. While we go through this, it may be helpful to refer to the human factors, barriers to situation awareness and decision making in your IRPG. On July 7, 2007 at 7.45 p.m., lightning started a fire near Hot Springs, South Dakota. The origin was located at the north end of Alabaugh Canyon, just below the Pine Shadows Housing Subdivision. The weather conditions in the southern Black Hills were unusually hot and dry. Al Stover was the local fire management officer and was called in as the IC. He entered Alabaugh Canyon from the north and proceeded south towards the fire. He found the fire working its way upslope to the east and down canyon to the south. They anchored the heel of the fire in the bottom of the canyon while air attack and two single engine air tankers made drops on the east ridge of the canyon to stop the fire from going into the subdivision. The fire continued to increase in intensity as it moved up and across the east wall of Alabaugh Canyon. The fuels were heavy on the slopes with very low crown base heights. After coordinating the initial plan, the IC drove back out of the canyon and around to the Pine Shadow subdivision. Because the IC happened to live in this subdivision, he was also getting fire updates from his wife on his cell phone. The fire worked its way south on the east side of the canyon and made a big run out of the canyon towards the south end of Pine Shadows. By 2048, the IC had local volunteer fire department personnel in the Pine Shadows subdivision and had requested a Type 3 incident management team. We're in Pine Shadow subdivision and these are the first two houses that were really impacted by the fire run up out of the canyon from this direction here. Um, this is the subdivision I live in. I live on the north end of the subdivision. Uh, this house here was where my daughter was just prior to the, uh, the fire coming out of the, uh, out of the canyon. Um, you know, very intense fire. Uh, we had a fire whirl hit the back side of that house and melted the siding off of it. And, you know, just spectacular fire behavior coming up out of the canyon behind uh, this house here. As a member of the local community and a homeowner in this subdivision, Al obviously had more on his mind than just being the IC. Let's listen to Al talk about how the elements of human factors played out in his decision making and what lessons he learned from this experience. I've never had this happen to me before, but I've been on fires where you know, structures have been lost, uh, you know, at risk. And yeah, a house is a house until it's your house. And that's the thing, uh, you know, when my wife called me up, you know, when I asked her, you know, if she could see anything in the canyon because of the concern, she calls me up and says it's right below the house. You know, it's different at that point. Air attack, I talked with them and they said, you know, it's, it's going to hit the structures very hard. I mean, these are my friends, my neighbors. You know, if it was somewhere that, uh, you know, I didn't have such close ties, it'd be lo it's lots easier to make those decisions objectively versus trying to separate, you know, the emotional ties to, to things. You know, it's very similar to, uh, you know, a doctor's. They, you know, you don't operate on a relative. You know, you can't make that decision-making process and things like that when you're attached to the patient, you know. Uh, you know, if you find yourself in that kind of a situation, probably the best thing to do is get out of that command position, whether it's operations or IC, um, and become an advisor to someone else. You know, turn it over, sit in the truck with them, you can brief them with your no local knowledge and things like that, but they can make that objective decision and not have the emotion that it's impossible for you to separate yourself from. After assigning resources to protect the first two houses, the IC moved south along a dozer line that had been completed from the subdivision to the flyway road. Local fire department personnel burned out the dozer line. At approximately 2130, the IC ordered a Type 2 incident management team. The IC arrived at a large safety zone on the north end of Flyway Road where he met with more incoming resources and gave a briefing. Here's the uh, what we call the Flyway Safety Zone and we had moved from Pine Shadow Subdivision. There was some, uh, some line uh, put in with the road grader, CAT, and uh, burnout with uh, 
uh, local uh, fire department engines, and we had black all the way to here. When we uh, got here, we started to gather up with some of the overhead and fire departments, local resources that were here. We pushed this safety zone immediately with the, with the dozer, uh, get some bare ground in. This became basically the ICP for quite some time. Well, the main concerns was getting people out of here. This thing came out of the canyon very rapidly. Of course, at night, uh, some of the residents are, are sleeping. Uh, it's more difficult to find the houses. Uh, and just the, uh, the sheer number of, of houses that needed to be evacuated very quickly was a problem. Kind of an objective was to try to keep hurting the uh, fire south and uh, keep it as close to the canyon rim as we could. You know, if we could work our way through the grassy knobs and uh, use the lighter fuels with uh, some dozer line and burn that out, we'd eliminate fire from impacting more structures. We knew eventually we were gonna end up down to the highway. As a backup plan, we we're gonna to have to back off to the flyway road and take it all the way to the highway, burning out around structures and doing the best we could. Before the plan could be implemented, a spot fire was seen on the east side of Flyway Road. Also at the briefing were Grant Gifford and Jay Kurth, both of whom had been dispatched as division supervisors. Jay Kurth was then reassigned as the Option Section Chief Type 3. While we were briefing, this patch of timber here is where the spot was. About that time, we started getting impacted with winds and this spot takes off and at the same time we start getting fire coming up out of the canyon and it's torching this tree and throwing additional spots across over here. We had uh, come up with a plan to try and put dozer line along Alaba Canyon and keep the fire from coming up out of the canyon and uh, that came out and uh, put us in a position of trying to hold the flyway road Last ditch effort trying to catch the spot, there was a road blade here and I grabbed it and I cut the fence and this is that maintainer's line where they took off trying to catch the spot. A fire came across the safety zone and over Flyway Road and got hit by the wind and immediately was going too fast to even be caught with the road graders. Um, from that point it put us in an entirely defensive situation and uh, we knew that we had structures throughout the area. The fire was increasing in size and intensity in all divisions. It broke through containment lines and spotted throughout the Pine Shadow subdivision. It continued to move south down the Alaba Canyon and was now spotting across Flyway Road. The one radio frequency assigned to the incident was completely clogged with traffic and chaos was how many of the firefighters described the situation. Once we had uh, the spotting and, and the adverse weather, you know, we gathered everyone up in this area uh, into the safety zone, the hand crews and uh, some of the engines. Um, same thing was going on on the other divisions, and they were all gathering up into safety zones. I called this, I don't know what structure engines were on it, this first house, and told them that they were going to get impacted shortly with fire. They pulled out, and me and Jay were sitting in the safety zone, and you could see there's another house just down here on top of the ridge and you can see the lights from the volunteer fire department that were set up on it and you can see the fire was going to impact it before long. Cynthia Ops and uh, Division Soup uh, went on a scouting mission to see what, uh, what uh, the new plan, what options we had for the new plan, you know, because the old plan was no longer going to work with the spotting. Because the operations section chief was less familiar with the area, the division supervisor got into the operations section chief's vehicle as they started back down Flyway Road. One of the four service engine captains took over the division supervisor's command vehicle and would shortly thereafter be promoted to task force leader. Roll changes on the fire line are very common and necessary during emerging incidents. However, they can also act as one of the barriers to situation awareness. Throughout the rest of this scenario, we will periodically visit with Dr. Ted Putnam to hear how various elements of human factors have the potential of working their way into our thought processes. Whenever you're given a job, your mind tends to focus on that and 
because of autopilot, then you start to lock in, attach to whatever that job is. If you change jobs uh, rapidly, <clears throat> like in a fire, you have a lot of experience, it's easier to do it, but there's always kind of a little inertia lag where part of you is still trying to do the old job and the new you is trying to pick up and see the different perspective. And if you don't change fast enough, usually your job changes, you know, to take on more responsibility. And if you hang on to the old responsibility, that interferes with seeing the bigger picture you're now assigned to provide leadership under. As the operations section chief and the division supervisor left the safety zone, the first house was now unstaffed and being overrun by fire. Down the road, local volunteers were coating the second house with a fire protection gel. The task force leader and two engines would eventually go down Flyway Road and end up at house number three. The IC stayed in the safety zone for a short time and then made his way back over the dozer line to assess the fire run through Pine Shadow subdivision. The operations section chief and division supervisor arrive at the second house to check on the volunteers. When it became apparent that the fire was making a strong run towards their position, they ordered the volunteers to leave. Interagency cooperation is very important. Um, familiarity with uh, who you're working with buys you a lot. We told the uh, structure resources that it wasn't a good place to be and it was time to pull out and had no luck. It took a lot for Grant and I to convince them that it was time to go. Um, primarily because they didn't know who we were. We didn't, they didn't know uh, what our authority was on the incident and stuff. So um, one of the engines, the gel truck, knew us and we said time to go and he bugged out immediately. It took a little convincing to get the other two engines to, to pull out and, and head out of the the area. I think some of that uh, human attachment was there. It, it typically is with uh, the volunteer fire department engines because they're they're committed to an, a structure. That's that's their their role. And so a lot of times in wildland incidents, when you give them a, a specific house to defend, they're going to defend that house. Um, the the thing that got us. Uh, the opportunity to break through that was when we mentioned the, the uh, structure protection specialist, Rick Lehman, who was from Rapid City Fire Department as an assistant chief, and they, they knew him. And when I said, he wants you to come down and tie in with him, they were more than happy to, to respond. Another barrier to situation awareness listed in your IRPG is the stress reaction of target fixation or locking into a course of action. Let's listen to Dr. Putnam share his thoughts on this element of human factors. Volunteer fire departments historically have a lot more attachment to the local homes. You know, it's, it's you know, in their community and the results of whether it burns or doesn't affects them, you know, more personally than if you're from out of the area. Once you start to prep a house, you get more and more involved in it, and therefore you have more ownership, more attachment, more resistance to leave. So as the division suit and night ops start to leave, they look back and nobody's moving from the volunteers. So they go back and this time get right up in their face and, and said they had to physically grab a hold of them, you know, and pull them to communicate, you know, staying isn't an option. You need to leave and leave now. And it could be with that break and what they would have done if they stayed on the autopilot response of protecting the house, shaking them up literally shakes up both their body and their mind and now they have a chance to look anew. After evacuating house number two, the operations section chief and the division supervisor started down the road to the third house. They were unaware that the fire had made its way further south in the bottom of Alaba Canyon, but had not crested the ridge line. As they made their way to the third house, they had to stop four different times because fire was jumping back and forth across the road. By this time, the task force leader with the two four service engines had arrived at the third house. It was extremely dark. Um, you couldn't see 
what we were actually calling an adequate safety was actually a really big safety zone. I mean, it was, it was a big, probably about a five acre field. But as we got in there, um, you know, we, we determined we were gonna um, fire out around the structure. And once we had started that, um, we were just, we, um, as the two engines that were in there and myself, had come up with the plan that we were just gonna let, uh, fire it out, let the main fire pass, and then we'd move out as needed. The task force leader had the crew members run a strip burn around the house, up the driveway, across the road, and back to the house. Just after midnight, the operation section chief and division supervisor pulled onto Cascade Springs Road. The conditions were dark and very smoky. As we rounded the corner coming into the third house, we weren't going to stay on it. We were going to grab everybody and run. From here, my initial impression was there was a lot of heat in and around the structure, even with their fire on the ground. It, it stayed on the ground, but you could tell that there was a lot of heat built up, and I didn't even know if the house would make it. Uh, as I approached, we got closer to the house. I guess my opinion started to change. You know, to me, it looked like they'd done a really good job keeping the fire to the ground. It was now moving away from the structure. Uh, and then you get into the whole deal that uh, these two engines I'd worked closely with over the years, and I had a higher comfort level with. Things were doing really well, and I remember Grant and I talking, thinking that, uh, you know, with the firing that they had done, the only thing that was going to get the house, we thought, was... Uh, direct flame impingement rolling over out of the canopy and onto the house. And the, the canopy was close enough to that house to where that could have occurred pretty easily. Operations and me talked and we pretty much instantly knew that we needed to at least try to fire the remaining patch of this timber island out and then we'd pull off and go to the next house. We knew uh, that if things changed we were standing in a, in a big safety zone, uh, stubble grass surrounded by black underneath it, and uh, the opportunity that we were talking about and the burnout that we were talking about was 30 to 40 feet long up and then right back down a 5 to 10 percent slope. Right here is where operations and myself had stopped and we're talking and looking at what we want to fire out. Basically we just wanted to take the strip up and then follow this natural little gentle slope back out to this point and wrap it and we we're going to pull the resources and go a minute to a minute and a half it should have taken. Once again let's refer to the human factors barriers to situation awareness and decision making in the IRPG and listen to Dr. Putnam discuss the human elements that may have played a part in this situation. And when they come in and all the people there this is the first time everybody's they're all forest service people and so <clears throat> there's more likely to be bonding, and these are people you work with, you know, off and on uh, anyway. So it's, it's like everybody's, you know, are people you know, you understand. So when you come into that environment, then you see what your own people are trying to accomplish. It's easier to relate to that, so you shift more naturally into the position of saying, well, what is it they're trying to accomplish here? And, and they're trying to burn out around that house. So they've gone from this conclusion that they saw so clearly with the volunteers. They come in with their own people, buy in to what their own people are doing, and now, you know, what can we do to help? By this time, the task force leader was in the safety zone with the Forest Service engines 663 and 664. Josh Lang, a crew member of 663, had completed the original burnout around the house and was asked to burn out some mowed grass around a travel trailer parked on the northeast side of the driveway. After we did the burnout around the house, I went and talked to Dalman and uh, he asked me to go and strengthen the line on the east side of the house um, by putting down some more fire. But the grass in that area was mowed grass, so it was, uh, wasn't carrying fire at all. So. I started my, making my way back towards the engines, and uh, that's when I ran into Grant and Jay. When the division supervisor and operations section chief arrived at the house, they got out of the vehicle to assess the situation. 
In doing so, the division supervisor left his radio, personal gear bag, and gloves in the truck. So when they jump out, their first thing that they're engaged in is doing the assessment, should we do anything like that or not? And in that role, the culture is like when you're getting out of a rig as a supervisor, you're going to make a quick assessment. You don't put on your PPE because it's going to be quick. You're going to jump back in the rig and you don't want to be buckling and unbuckling your gear. So that was, you know, one of the things that they were going to do. Then they decide that the thing to do is to shift gears now and they need to hurry up and get some more fire on the ground so they have a crew member nearby ask the crew member to come up and the division soup now says that he'll you know take that person and show them you know where to lay the fire and watch actually be a lookout for that person because you know the main fire is still on its way and going to be there fairly soon times of the essence but it that moment in time, the division soup shifted from being a planner, where the original plan, pull everybody out, the next plan is maybe to lay that strip. As soon as he shifts gear, he should have had the realization that I'm no longer a supervisor. I'm now going out and I'm going to go tactical and implement you know, the action, which is to <clears throat> lay the strip of fire. So he loses that focus. It was okay to jump out without your PPE for the one thing, but not for the second. But the one thing that I didn't look at or uh, didn't recognize in my mind was, you know, I was focusing on Grant's face and talking about the things that were going on. And uh, I never looked at him physically to, do you have your, your fire shelter in your pack and do you have your, your gloves and all of your PPE and uh, it's something that just never registered in my mind. And the reason you fail to note it is because autopilot takes you, shifts you into that new role and earlier I mentioned when you shift into a new role a lot of times things get lost because part of you, part of your mind's tugging at you to be what you were and and what that's really saying is that part of that limited uh, cognitive capacity is being eaten up by the role shift and so you have less awareness to uh, look at you know what the new situation is and because they're parked in a safety zone there really isn't any concern from the main fire and because there isn't concern from the main fire part of that may have transmitted into when the division soup goes up into the timber, you know, that the fact that that big safety zone is right there, only, you know, 40, 50 feet away, you know, that we're okay here. And he doesn't then, there's no plan for if anything unexpected happens and maybe a false sense of security due to that huge safety zone. The division supervisor instructed the crew member from 663 to follow him into the timber to complete the secondary burnout while the operation section chief went to the safety zone to talk to the task force leader. From the time that Grant and Josh started the burn operation, I stood there long enough to make sure that the fire that they were putting on the ground was uh, sucking over and into the, uh, the, the initial burnout. Um, when I saw that was occurring, I moved over to, to talk to Jeremy Dolman, the, the task force leader, and let him know that we had uh, grabbed his uh, crew member and that uh, they were doing a, a, a real short operation and, and we're going to be coming back into the safety zone. The division supervisor and the crew member started the burnout and took note of a small spot fire in the meadow at the edge of the timber. They were still unaware how far the fire had moved south in the bottom of Alaba Canyon. At this point, Josh is having a hard time keeping his torch lit due to the winds. Everything's sucking in, pulling into the fire around the house well. Uh, that was the first time I turned back. I was ahead of Josh. As we progress, his torch starts staying lit. And I would say somewhere in this vicinity, I turn around again 
and I'm noticing more of a flanking out pattern from his firing. It's sucking in still, but it's wanting to flank away from it. As we continue, I'm seeing uh, a massive glow coming out of the canyon. It's very evident at this point in time. And as I'm starting to get over here, I can see fire on the back side of the ridge. The fire around the house is really hot at this point. So I know there's no option to cut to the left. The wind goes slack at some point in there, and uh, I recognized that, and then uh, opened the, the door to my vehicle, and uh, all of a sudden a wind gust hit, hit, hit us, and uh, about knocked the, blew the door out of my hand, and I thought it was going to blow the door off the car. Um, so when I looked up, there was an exponential change in fire behavior that had occurred. As I entered, there was a, a really small spot kind of off at the point here in this timber. And between our fire and it, I think it just button hooks around us. And at that point, we're cut off. As I look out in the meadow, I got a continuous line of fire out in the meadow. Most of it, I'd say, is four to six foot flame lengths. There's a finger that's jetted back that has like two foot flame lengths that isn't with the rest of the front. And you can just basically draw a straight line up under the slope, this little slope here. And at this point, we got four to six foot flame lengths all the way underneath us. And that's when I turned and I grabbed Josh and I said, we gotta make a run for it now. Get rid of your torch, we're running for it. I pulled the, his radio out of his chest harness and I called operations, told him we've been cut off, we gotta make a run for it. That was the only transmission I made. And at that point in time, I thought our best chance was going for the finger with two foot flame lengths through the grass. I didn't want to stay in this timber patch. I knew that. And I could tell that whatever was coming up out of the canyon wasn't going to be a good place to be either. When he stopped and he was like, all right, uh, we're going to have to start a different direction, you know. I kind of tell the urgency in his voice, you know, that we need to go and we need to go now, you know. But at that time, you know, it was just like, all right, you know, we'll be out of here, you know, he'll, we'll find a way out. And so um, at that point, you know, not really too nervous about what was going on, you know, I was just following my officer at that time and uh, didn't feel uncomfortable about it at all. Right here is where I, I knew I could see this, there was a good straight shot and we start running and as we come out, you know, we're at a, a good jog and the wind's starting to pick up a bit. As we progress towards that direction, the urgency just built faster and faster every, you know, every couple of seconds, you know. We'd move, we started moving at a quicker pace. We're still, we're still headed for this finger that's right out here that has two foot flame lengths on it. Uh, you know, right out in here, I'd say it's four to six foot still in the grass. Unburned, you know, knee high grass. Somewhere right in here, I feel a really strong downburst, and I grabbed Josh by the shirt collar and I told him. He felt the down draft, and so, like he said, you know, grab hold of me and, all right, let's hold here for a second, you know. We gotta see what it's gonna do. I didn't even get the words out of my mouth. Uh, instantly, this is now 30 foot flame links laid running at us. At that point, you know, my focus really went into concentrating on what Grant wanted me to do and to follow his orders, you know, to a T, you know. At that point, it was about, you know, keeping track of where he was at because that's where I was going. I just did a quick scan, turned around, and just about where this tree is right here, there's four to six foot flames. And I told him that's where we're going, we got to run through it. And at this point, it's a dead sprint. I mean, this is chasing us as quick as we're moving. He was right in front of me, and we're running for our lives at that point. You know, we're putting everything we got into it. We run towards the flame front. He jumps and covers his face, and I do the same, and we end up in the black. And at that point, uh, he has me get low because the smoke's extreme at that point, tough to breathe little to no visibility, you know. Once we come through it, uh, you know, to me it was dark, extremely smoky. I couldn't see all this timber. I thought I was standing in a meadow. And 
I felt that it was going to be a hot, smoky safety zone at this point. We might have been here for a minute or two at tops, and there was a tree that torched over here. And we got some radiant heat from it, and we had felt the embers hitting us with the wind. And at first it dawned on me, I thought it was weird because I originally thought we were in the grass, we are in a meadow. And at that point in time, I grabbed Josh and I told him, you know, we'll just bump over out of the way here and we'll be, just get away from the radiant heat from that tree. We started moving around and he was just keeping us away from any of the radiant heat off any of the trees that were torching. And um, at that point, you know, I was like, we'll probably just ride it out right here. And then, you know, in a matter of seconds, that plan changed. We get here. I get Josh back low on the ground, and we're maybe here for five seconds. Just an instant blast of hot air. I can feel the skin on my right side of my face. I stand in about like this. Josh is right here by my knee. And as I feel the skin start to burn on my face, I can look over and I can just see a huge wall of glow and it's starting to raise into the canopies. Then suddenly, you know, we got a, a heat blast and uh, we both could feel it. And at that instant, that's when Grant said, get your shelter out. We got to deploy. I yell at Josh to deploy his shelter. And I say, I'm burning, I'm burning. And at that point, I cover my face and my airway. As soon as I bring my hands up around my face, the skin of my hand starts to run is how I describe it. It felt like somebody was pouring water off. You could just feel the skin bubbling and coming off. Uh, at that point in time, it was, it was weird. Uh, there's this surge of adrenaline. I think it's your mind telling you, oh, sh you're burning at this point. Uh, I, I had this immense power in my legs telling me it's time to run. You know, I, and as I was burning, I can remember almost a football stance, chopping my feet just instantly, wanting to run. But my mind's telling me, no, you're not running. You gotta stay put. And uh, you know, then just <laughs> the adrenaline kicks in 100 fold right there. And uh, you're like, all right, you know, we're actually doing it. This is, this is life or death right here. It's, we're getting in this or we're not, you know. And he's struggling getting his pack off. He's in a kneeling position. Uh, he struggles with the top buckle and he can't get the bottom buckle undone. He finally gets it, he opens his pack, and as he gets to the shelter, he's pulling his gloves off. And he tries to do the strap around the shelter and he misses it and it won't pull. I honestly don't remember actually taking off my gloves until, you know, revisiting the site and seeing my gloves there. Um, and I think it was because, you know, the mobility trying to get the tab off. He finally gets it, and as he flops it out with the new generation shelter, he missed the left and right hand tabs, and he couldn't get the shelter open. I reached down because I could see him, and I told him, you missed the hand tabs, and I grabbed it, and I just shook it once, and it instantly opened up. And I just put the, it was perfect with the wind, and I put it over his head, and as he was getting in, I asked him, you know, for me, that's, this is the toughest part of the whole deal. Here I am without my PPE, and I have to ask a young man to share his shelter with me. Uh, there's just a lot of guilt that goes with that, endangering his life because I didn't have my equipment. So he graciously said yes. Uh, and as I'm crawling in the shelter, I can tell that at this point, you know, this is a full crown fire and everything's starting to want to suck right up to us from all directions. You can see the end drafting in that building. And that's when I crawled in. Uh, inside the shelter, you know, I expected to be laying on top of Josh's legs or not having much room. And he had kind of gone into a ball in a fetal position at the front of the shelter. And I ended up sitting down cross-legged because I felt that I could use my butt and my legs to hold the shelter down because I didn't know how much heat we'd get impacted with and I didn't think my hands were going to be able to do it. 
once I was in there, it just became, uh, really for me, it was all about uh, just praying. As soon as I started praying, it just put me at ease. You know, I was, you know, in a, in a life or death situation right there. And so, you know, I was getting myself right. And, uh, you know, just, um, it just put a calming effect on you, you know, so. And then I started talking about his burns, how he was doing, and he thought that his airway was closing. And at that point in time, you know, I thought that he'd taken heat to his airway and that we needed to get out and call for Mayday. Uh, I told him to stay in the shelter. I crawled out. The radio that I had, I dropped right near the shelter because I couldn't hold on to it when I was being burnt. And I picked it up and tried to call emergency traffic, mayday, mayday, emergency traffic. There's been a deployment and I couldn't break through the radio. Uh, took several times just before operations and the other two four service engines could hear it just down the hill from us here. And at that time we could just barely see, Jay was said he couldn't see us and I just told him to keep coming. And we could see him driving straight north and I told him, you know, we're off your back quarter panel at a 45 degree and he just started backing up and we told him to stop and we picked up and ran towards him. Uh, Josh wasn't going to let go of the shelter for anything and took it with him and I threw the radio down to Mark where we actually had deployed. So. The Alibaugh fire was contained five days later on July 12th after burning over 10,000 acres. During the first 24 hours, the fire burned 5,000 acres, destroyed 27 homes, and claimed the life of one homeowner. The final investigation report can be found on the Lessons Learned website. At this time, let's take a break and read part of the summary Dr. Putnam wrote in his analysis of the human factors on the Alibaugh fire. 